From the time he arrived in Berkeley in 1965, Tyler made art from found objects, detritus, junk. He made sculptures that resemble humans, animals, and curious abstract sculptures that have no resemblance to reality. His creations are laden with cultural, social, and political energy. His work is, by its nature, whimsical, often humorous, and can be thought of as curious, maybe incongruous. It's abstract. It's whatever the found material wanted to be. It issued a directive and Tyler complied. Part of the directive was to allow the found objects to retain their natural spirit, detritus. No polishing or highly sophisticated techniques for a metamorphosis into a dazzling thing of beauty. The names he gave them were pointed and obvious, mundane and mythical. He painted and wrapped and conjoined his creations, allowing them to release their spirit. The constructions are primitive and haphazardly painted, assembled to allow the original bones to retain their authenticity, their true identity. He installed art on the Berkeley and Emeryville waterfronts during the 70s. Snoopy and his Sopwith camel going up against Baron von Richthofen in his Fokker flying machine, mounted on old wharf piers in the bay. When the planes were destroyed from the storms and surf, he'd build new airplanes to replace them. He added post people sculptures, Viking, pirate, and King Tut ships, a Chinese junk, alien spacecraft, a submarine, and other whimsical ideas that popped out of his imagination. The remnants of the last Red Baron plane can still be seen on the Emeryville fishing pier. During his formative years on the West Coast, he enjoyed the company of artists forging a new expression of work while distancing themselves from East Coast abstract expressionists. They would come to be known as Bay Area Funk and Bay Area Pop Art. Many in the new unorganized style incorporated figurative and other art expressions. The new West Coast art style, like all art, reflected influences from earlier works such as Dadaism, Cubism, Surrealism, and Modernism styles. He was surrounded by people like William T. Wiley, Manuel Neri, Viola Frey, Clayton Bailey, Roy DeForest, Peter Volkus, Bruce Connor, and others. One of the characteristics of funk was found object and assemblage art, which was driven by a repudiation of the consumer culture, which Bruce Connor became known for, particularly for his three-dimensional paintings. Wally Hedricks and Jess were two of the first to use found objects in their work. As a funk artist, Robert Arneson elevated ceramics to a fine art form. Robert Arneson, Roy DeForest, Manuel Neri, William T. Wiley, and others taught funk at the University of California, Berkeley. Tyler discovered a way to incorporate new technology into his work to to simplify the creation of collages using the new Xerox color and color process. His work was recognized and exhibited at the Richmond Art Center, the Oakland Museum, the the San Francisco City Hall, the Berkeley City Hall, and many permanent collections across the country. Tyler had a one-man show at the John Bowles Gallery in 1969, and he became a member of the Bowles Stable before the age of 30. He helped to expand the use of the Xerox process by giving classes at various venues and he taught at UC Berkeley, the Art Institute, and SF State. He was one of a group of artists commissioned in 1978 by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to compete in its soapbox derby. He used a red Fokker with a 14-foot wingspan he had built for a San Francisco City Hall exhibit. He said, It was so great to show art in the open going downhill at 30 miles per hour that I then started doing outdoor work on Emeryville and Berkeley posts near the freeway for the public to see. 
Over the years, I've put about 40 planes, ships, subs, post people, and a shark in the bay. After the soapbox derby, the plane was installed in the entry of the Albany High School Theater, where his daughter went to school. His job as a restaurant designer for Mel's Diners gave him the freedom to work in the studio. Art was paramount and he ignored the troublesome profit motive or any elusive campaign for celebrity status. His artwork was always for the pleasure of the public. He had no interest in the technology that drove the world around him. It progressively narrowed his view and distanced him from the techno-social demands that command the rest of us. He remained in the calm iteration of his own world. It was comfortable, and it allowed his focused attention on art. He was satisfied with simple, familiar, comfortable, and necessary essentials. He used the phone for essential contact, or he sent invitations and correspondence in his signature decorated handwritten letters. He made large 218 page 8.5 by 11 scrapbooks filled with collages, press clippings, gallery openings, art announcements, friends impromptu art, and much of his own editorial, much like a diary, while inserting the daily material that fills the books. Fifty of the books reside in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. They fill cabinets at his home and in the studio, over 500 of them. Tyler maintained contact with artists, friends, and associates throughout his long career. Their signed notes, cards, and invitations went into his scrapbooks. He was obsessed in a profound, nearly sacred way in performing his job daily. He'd been working in the same Albany studio since 1976, and it shows. It's filled with the products of a liberated, unfettered consciousness. Sculptures, masks, life-size anthropomorphic figures, and abstract objects fill his studio. In his youth, Tyler expressed his creativity by altering and customizing his first car, a 52 Chevy Bel Air Coupe. In Joplin, Missouri, he said, they'd tar and feather you if you wanted to be an artist. After high school, he spent the summer of 1960 in New York City with his uncle, Ernst Badel. He studied at the Sculpture Center and spent his time in galleries, museums, and at the village every night. Before returning home, his uncle took him to meet a friend, Nicholas Caron, in Amagansett, who was a neighbor of Jackson Pollock. He spent hours with Caron telling me Pollock's stories. He said the night Pollock's wife returned from her trip to Europe just after Pollock's death, the whole neighborhood spent the night looking for things Pollock, a dripped, painted kitchen floor of 12 by 12 tiles taken up and mounted and framed. Paintings, large and small, all around the neighborhood, traded for groceries and given to friends. In 1963, he moved back to Joplin and entered the University of Kansas for his BFA in drawing and painting, where he met his wife, Kathy. He studied sculpture at CCAC in Oakland in 1965. He taught and lectured at UC Berkeley, CCAC, and the Art Institute in San Francisco. From his youth in that 52 Chevy, his passion for car art remained steadfast. He had several customized cars during his lifetime, and he was active in and served as the historian for the West Coast Customs, a car club in California. He inserted all the car club correspondence and activity in the books he worked on daily. He assumed a physical identity that presented the air of a sophisticated but dated artist by wearing a cravat inside an Oxford shirt and a comfortable lightweight field coat with multiple pockets. He wore a well-trimmed, full-face beard which was white for years. 
He was tall with a handsome stature. We met through a mutual friend almost 20 years ago. In 2010, I helped him photo document his studio of work and created a catalog, mudflat sculpture, that he used to introduce himself to galleries. We also produced an artist coffee table book, Tyler James Orr, Sculpture, Color Xerox, and Collage with Emily Raguso in 2014, which was used in the same way. For my work on the two projects, he offered me the sculpture of my choice. Without hesitation, I picked Athena, one of his post people, which he promptly delivered after we completed the books. In about 30 years, there have been 30 uh, airplanes and ships and whatever. I number them, and the one I just did was number 31. After about 30 some years, one a year. And that's the newest ones this year, the Red Baron and Sopwith Camel in Emeryville. Tyler was inspired by an article in the Chronicle which appeared in April. It listed some popular landmarks now missing from the Bay Area, including the Red Baron and his Red Fokker pitched in a deadly battle with Snoopy in the world-famous Sopwith Camel. The article resonated in his mind, creating an idea and an invitation. To know that the public was experiencing some nostalgia for those popular old figures was gratifying and it spurred an immediate plan. He decided to recreate the two fighters and give them new life on the remaining piers at the Emeryville Marina. Uh, this one is the Green Baron, the uh, Green Sop with Camel, which will go in the bay with the Red Baron. Uh, this one uh, I had from an old airplane, the shoes, the wheels, the front, so it wasn't much trouble to go ahead and build the airplane from that. Um, this is my workspace, and then out here is the Red Baron. The Red Baron is the oldest. I started in 1975, put out the Red Baron. It was there for about 10 years. There hasn't been one there for about five years, so this is going to be a new experience, people will get to see the Red Baron in Emeryville. The other one was in Berkeley, but the posts in Berkeley are in too bad a shape, so I'm doing it in Emeryville this time, again in the mudflats of the San Francisco Bay. On Saturday of June 9th, volunteers met at the pier where Dan Lynch delivered the new planes, and we all spent the afternoon installing the new art exhibit. Thank mm -hmm. you. 